Welcome back to panel two of SGCF Academy Live 2022. How to bring your bar program to life. Designing a new bar program can be a daunting activity, whether it is at the birth of a new establishment or a seasonal concept change. Our panel of bar owners shared their journey in designing and bringing their bar programs to life successfully. Moderating this panel is Jay Gray, owner of Seiko House and Low Tide Singapore. Joining Jay on this panel are Martin Hudak, co-owner of Maybe Sammy Australia. Gerald Koo, co-owner of Stay Gold Flamingo Singapore. Silius Gunrad, founder and creative director of the Compound Collective Singapore. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, how are we? Uh, my name is Jay Gray and I am here with you from Singapore. And today we're going to talk all about how to bring a bar program to life. Now, this is a huge question and we'd love to know what you think is the most important factor of bringing your bar program, program to life. Share responses in the chat box, please, and we will shoot them through as questions later on in the chat. All right. Looks like we are all together now. Okay, so uh, allow me to introduce today. I have with me uh, Celia Spoonrad from Compound Collective Group, uh, who operate Barbary Coast and newly opening Revival in UE Square. They also have CC Consulting Division C, uh, which focuses on research and development as well as FMG, uh, FMCG. Say hello there, Celia. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> good, good. Uh, we have Mr. Martin Hudak, co-owner of Maybe Sammy, Maybe Sammy Sydney, and author of Spiritual Coffee that's just been released for your enjoyment. Please say hello. Hi, everybody. All right. And finally, we have Gerald Ku, co-owner of Stay Gold, recently opened on a Moy Street. And I'm sure those of you who are in Singapore have all been down to have a drink. Say hello there, Gerald. Hey, guys. What's up? Fantastic. All right, so firstly, thank you, the three of you, for joining this, uh, this <coughs> uh, not debate, <laughs> this discussion about how to bring a bar program to life. And I think one of the key things that often gets overlooked is actually where to start. And previously, when we talked to each other, we looked a lot at knowing your audience and the jump off point being the importance of market analysis, knowing what you're getting yourself into and knowing what your guests and your peers are also doing. So Celia, why don't you kick us off? What, what do you think is the most important factor of market analysis whilst building your bar program or bringing it to life? Well, there's, from our experience, there's two ways to kind of get started. And funny enough, now we've done both of them. So you can either have your full fledged concept before you find the space and then just tweak it to make it work in the space. Or you could have a space and then see what concept will work best in that neighborhood with other surrounding businesses. You know, like what's your clientele? What's your niche? Is it more CBD focused? Is it more of a neighborhood bar? And then you work around that. So for us, it's always very important to do a really comprehensive competitor analysis as well to make sure that whatever you build is going to work and that it has a unique selling point. Absolutely. We'll talk about unique selling points here as well. Um, when we're embarking on this, let's say, uh, Mr. Martin, like with maybe Sammy, I think you mentioned that uh, previously you had one idea of what maybe Sammy wanted to be and it changed over time due to the market. What are your feelings on this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in the end of the day, it's not really what I believe is the best or uh, what we as the owners want to create it's in the end of the day what the local area and your regular guests uh want you know it's all about demand and the style so yes we had a certain idea and feeling and style from beginning three years ago but we really had to tweak it according to the taste and the preferences of our audience and in the end of the day you know the whole concept and idea and the structure of the menu was amended according to what they like and that was a massive change because I could be rather stubborn and go my way and maybe my business will fail and really empty. But in the end of the day, I said, this is it. You know, the bar is living, living organism. 
I really have to adapt and I have to wait for my guests to dictate what they really want and what they expect. And the same way for my team. That's how we feel about it. Nice. Very good. And uh, Gerald, you have just embarked on this quite recently uh, for a stay gold flamingo. When you and the team were sort of developing uh, your market analysis and your strategy, what were some of the key things that you looked into before opening up on the Moy Street, uh, which has a lot of venues on it already? So one of the things that we did was to really look into the bars that we have in Singapore and specifically what kind of bars do we enjoy going and why do we enjoy going there. At least, you know, we, we, do, we, we want to do something that we are proud of and we want to do and that to make sure that the market is ready for it. So, you know, the three of us, we sat down and we said that, hey, we like to go to this bar for this and that reason and we want to make sure that we have that element in what we do at Stego Flamingo. Fantastic. Um, now, we, we talked a little bit about uh, unique selling points and, and sort of what they mean to our venues. So it briefly came up. And I think also that alludes to authenticity as well, because certainly we all have to experience what we want to be delivering to our guests before we deliver it to them. We have to be well versed in, in the concept we want to bring to life or the program that we want to bring to life. Um, what sort of R&D goes into uh, developing a concept after you've decided maybe area, uh, location, um, whether you found the building first or you've, you've decided later, what sort of research and development do we all do to keep our concepts authentic and fresh and give them a unique selling point? Who wants to take this one first? I'll start picking on people. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, you broke first, Celia. <laughs> I always break first. Um, <laughs> all right, well, I mean, like, I think it's important to, and this is something that we discussed quite at length um, last week when we, when we did a little trial run of this. I think having fluidity is probably the most important thing. You know, like you can, as Martin was saying, you can say, okay, like, these are the things that I want to do, but if it's not going to work in the area or the space, you have to be able to be fluid. And Anyone that's ever had to do construction on a project will know that nothing ever actually goes to plan. So you have to be completely fluid in absolutely every aspect of it. And in terms of the R&D, again, like that comes down to identifying what your unique selling point is going to be. You know, like if you're a neighborhood bar, do you really want to be doing a very, very like technical high touch program because it might not fit? Or is that something that you specifically want to do because it's going to be very unique? I think it's it's a bit harder to, to identify what a USP is because it's going to be so incredibly unique to your team, to your product, to your venue, to your outlet, to your location. Absolutely. Gentlemen, how do we feel about that on your ends? Yeah, I, it... I agree with what you said about the unique selling points, about your team, especially how they feel. And uh, I would like to highlight that for us specifically, maybe Sammy here, the unique selling point is, is, the, is the, the human interaction, this point of entertainment we do with our guests. So yes, you can get decent cocktails these days around our neighborhood, you know, the amazing cocktail bars and everyone's doing these days good cocktails. So what we're trying to think about how we can diversify our selling points, what is the difference of the, of the selling for us? And it's basically our team because they are so diverse, so different and they understand and it's really them who make the difference is really them who's selling the product and selling the whole experience rather than necessarily just the drink itself. So that's what's working for us very well here at Maybe Semi is this whole entertainment uh, um, selling point. Yeah, yeah, you, you certainly do from what I've seen on Instagram, bring, uh, bring every single drink to life. <laughs> and the, music, the musical numbers uh, definitely don't hurt. Uh, well, Gerald, you, are, you, have, you have some sort of musical skills, you know, if I have interviewed with a new uh, bartender or floor member, I, I will have to check if they have a rhythm, or what kind of music they like, and they're playing some instruments, that's the criteria. Yeah, yeah. And, and Gerald, you and the team at Stay Gold have actually worked together or around each other for a very long time, um, so you have that mm -hmm. bond um, already. You, you, you've, some of you worked at the same bars, definitely have worked with the same group. Um, how was it bringing sort of your ideas to life as a group and as a team, uh, making sure that, you know, it wasn't just a, an echo chamber, you know, or a sounding board. 
how did you guys go about that when you were bringing your bar home life and stay gold? I think one of the key aspects of uh, Stay Go Flamingo is that we are bridging uh, both styles of uh, bartending. One is the Western style and one is uh, the Japanese style, or so to say, Eastern style of bartending. So I think for right from the start, it was very clear that when both me and uh, Chawe came together, it was a, a two, different, um, two different styles of bartending. And that echoes to the team as well that while you can be very technical with your shake, your stir and stuff like that, the atmosphere and the ambience has to resonate in a more like, you know, what, 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 it, what Martin does at, at uh, maybe semi. It is like an, a form of entertainment, but of course for us it's not to that extent and not to that level yet. You know, the experience of the guests is, is, is still the, at the forefront and how they feel at the venue and even down to the music and the playlist that we select, it's a bit more edgy. <laughs> Uh, so I like to use the word kind of like it's, it's called street posh to describe what like, uh, sorry what Stego Flamingo really is you know, there's this sense of posh of being in a venue with cocktails and, and booze but there's also this sense of street where it kind of makes it everything more casual yeah so that's 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 in in general what we do at Stego Flamingo classical punk <laughs> <laughs> Well, whilst we're on this subject as well of, of sort of uh, merging uh, of minds and meeting of minds and, and ideas, what sort of risks do you, would you say are the right risks to take when you're pushing authenticity and, and pushing a unique selling point or, or being authentic? Some people can be afraid to push the boundaries. Some people can be very afraid to break a mold. When, if you were giving advice to a colleague or a peer or a friend who's about to embark on their first business or opening, um, what risks do you tell them to avoid and what risks do you tell them to just go for it and see how it works out? Honestly, like, I'll start if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, please. I think the one thing that we haven't actually touched on that is super important is your, like, your financial buffer when opening a bar, right? So it's easy to sit here and say, like, yes, you need to take these risks or not, but it's, again, it's going to come down to what your financial buffer is going to allow. Especially... Now, if you if anyone's embarked on a recent construction, like mid construction costs are increasing because of like global shipping shortages and supply chain issues, right? So while we were building revival, our cost of stainless steel went up 40% mid build, which is somewhat unforese unforeseen, but obviously like you have a financial buffer to help with that. So I think the risks that you're able to take are gonna come down to what you can afford to take. Yeah, and no, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, uh, in essence, after the market research has been done and we sort of settled on USP, we really do need to address what we have in the kitty and what can and can't be uh, taken for granted. Um, how, how did you guys feel on the build for Stay Gold when you know, you're coming into a sort of in and out of like a down economy in Singapore, similar to the revival, of course, being built at this time. Um, how did you and the team feel about what risks you could take on, on that build and would it affect your uh, arguably most important uh, piece of being able to hire a team that lives and breathes the concept? You know, did you have to weigh up, was the venue going to be more beautiful and we would maybe have less staff or, you know, how did you guys sort of navigate that? I think certainly there was a lot of balance in that. And I feel it when Celia mentioned that stainless steel, uh, the price of stainless steel went up by 40%. You're kind of like, oh shit, I, I know how that feels. Uh, for us, I think, yeah, we also had a buffer and we had to compromise in terms of how we want the venue to look. I remember going back and forth with our ID and our finance to negotiate what should we do and what should we not do. Because yes, we still have to keep in mind the other costs that goes into opening a new business and a new bar. And the good thing is that some of the things that we do uh, at, at Flaming, Stego Flamingo was literally done by our own hands. You know? So we chose to, have, uh, to build our own or to finish our own wall instead of having texture paint and that saved us a couple of thousands. And in turn, that became like a story that we tell to our guests that, hey, you know, these, these walls are actually done by us during a time where we felt like 
uh, we want to save, we want to sub cut some costs there. So I think that became a, a form of uh, uh, a, 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 an aspect of uh, Stego Flamingo's story. And, and then, Oh, the other risk is that and I think I like to say I like to put it in this in this in this scenario where we are we are we are we are kind of blessed or we it is kind of a blessing in these guys because Tego Flamingo was slated to open much earlier than September. But for us, I think we we're kind of lucky with the with the with the delay because any earlier than September it would have been a different scenario. It would have been phase two, H P2 HA and, and stuff like that. So opening in September kind of was, it was a smooth transition into a uh, normal scene in Singapore. So yeah. that was kind of like a risk that we were mitigating and, and navigating through through the opening. Yeah, definitely having a, you know, launching a brand is uh, timing is everything. Um, Martin, uh, so, you know, someone who, who's launched a few brands inside and outside of, of maybe Sammy as well, you know, when, when you guys are and you, your, your team is looking at when's the right time to, to do the pop-up for the cafe or when's the right time to expand maybe Sammy and take that risk? Definitely yeah. during these times. Yeah, I mean, uh, I would say uh, it's very hard to take a risk when you are new in the game and on the scene in the area. You know, you don't really know how much you can risk and afford and, you know, how much you can really do. But once you build your name, and you are out there, like what happened with us and maybe semi after three years, you feel more confident and comfortable to take risks. Because even if you do mistake, let's say, or if you take a wrong risk and it won't work out in the end, you know, it's still a different game because you're already out there. If I would do the, those mistakes in the beginning, you would be probably ruined. So we took two risks last year. Uh, we opened a semi junior, the sister venue of maybe semi, which is a daily cafe slash aperitivo bar, first of its kind in Australia. We opened Dean and Nancy hotel bar uh and everything happened literally just month before we went in the longest lockdown in sydney so it was a massive risk uh but that kind of helped us uh those four months to sit down back and realize what really matter and how we should react to whole pandemic situation here in sydney and now we are back open in the business and uh i think it's way better than before so taking the risk during pandemic during such a hard times really helped us to become better and stronger if we would open those two bars in the beginning probably would, it would be as successful or would be that good. So really through that hardship, I would say those two new concepts, uh, they are slowly thriving. Awesome. Great advice, everyone. Um, I also think we, we sort of need to address the elephant in the room, which is building personality into your concept, which is in essence, the lifeblood of your concept or your bar program will be your team, right? Um, we haven't, we've touched on it a little bit, but how, uh, how would one look at building a team that lives and breathes the concept? What, what are, what are the, the options available? It's definitely in the saturated market as well um, that I think we're all experiencing of staff shortages. How do you build personality into your concept? How do you build a team that lives and breathes that? Who'd like to start this one? I see a smile on your face, Gerald. A wry smile. Do you want to take this one? Uh, yeah, sure, man. I think it starts with uh, the hiring process. You know, if your if your concept is about rock and roll, you gotta hire someone who can rock and roll, right? You don't want someone who dislikes rock and roll and just wanna be a homebody. So it starts right from the start, and you cannot expect along the way that a certain individual would become like the person that you want him to be. I think we need to hear and see what 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 someone wants to be and we guide them towards uh we guide as as managers and as, as employers we have to guide them towards where they want to go right and that's only the right way to be natural and inject the personality of your of your diverse team into your brand and i guess I that it. was oh. <laughs> sorry sorry man well, i just like <laughs> you said that word personality and I would, I just agree so much. We don't hiring employees or workers or partners. We hiring personalities and more personalities you have, more diverse is your team and more has to offer. And it's more colorful. It, everyone, as you said, not everyone has to love rock and roll or not everyone has to listen Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr. You know what I mean? But maybe that's the beauty of the team. You are so diverse and different. And whenever someone asks me, oh, I want to work for you guys. 
uh, what do you expect? I have so many years of experience, this and that, and I'm on this competition and that. I don't really care. What I care about is your personality. Like, what is interesting? You know, give me your selling point. And we just found out the other day that our barback has his own Spotify channel where he's recording own songs. And he's like one of the best singers I ever heard. And another guy playing trombone since age of four. And we didn't know those things. And I think that's the key selling points and personalities we want to build around our team. Because, yes, I can teach you how to make cocktails. We can give you spreadsheets, et cetera, et cetera. I can maybe teach you uh, hospitality and sequence of service. But if you have something unique, which is just yours, that's what we want here. Is that similar to the llamas that I just saw on Instagram a second ago? <laughs> <laughs> did, I, did I not see llamas entering the venue? <laughs> yes, I'm sitting in the venue right now at the moment, but it really smells like zoo. Uh, we have llamas for the last two hours inside the venue because one of my team members, Sarah, uh, she's competing in local competition. And I told her, just be crazy, be yourself. Uh, I'm I supporting you, whatever you need. And she said, yeah, I'm hiring two llamas for my video shoot of making my cocktails. So... Here we are, personalities. <laughs> there we go. All right. So we're empowering our team. Celia, how 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 does the compound collective group sort of help to empower the team and enrich that personality process? I think a lot of it's seeing potential. Um, I think in terms of not just hiring but promoting, seeing potential in someone that they don't necessarily see in themselves yet, and then empowering them to live up to the role that you know they're capable of. And so I think it's a lot of what we do. Yes, it's personality, but it's also working with potential. You can have someone whose heart isn't in it and they're going to be much harder to teach and inspire than someone whose heart is completely in it. It's identifying where they're at in their personal progression and obviously their career progression is really important. And uh, I think we all have techniques about how we go through that, whether it be review processes, etc. cetera. Um, I'm getting a five minute knock on the door just so everyone knows. So, <laughs> um, let's talk quickly about how uh, the digital age has sort of changed the game in terms of bringing our, our wider programs, not only to life, but to life across the world. We, we now don't necessarily have to rely exclusively on regulars. Um, we can have people when tourism opens back up who are just dying to come into our venues. So, so what, what sort of steps and techniques have we taken uh, to grow our, our personality digitally? Man. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I thought you just- I knew, I knew, I knew you're gonna, you're gonna point at me. I love social media, don't get me wrong. I'm obsessed with it. I'm spending many hours on the phone. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, you, you, can, you can hate it, you can be against it, et cetera it's a great marketing tool. Like you have to do it from day one. Uh, most of the marketing within the group is run by me um, because it's something what I studied in younger age, something what I really like to do. Uh, and I feel close to it and connected with my guests and followers. We have external internal marketing company and agencies helping us. It's very, very, very important. You can be great. You can be good. You can be amazing. You can be famous locally, but if you're not going to, tell about yourself to the rest of the world. If you're not going to promote yourself, no one will know how good you are. It's a great marketing tool. Use it wisely. Uh, be smart about it. Invest money into it. You know, in terms of budgeting, plan certain amount of money for good photographer, videographer, uh, posts, you know, and Googles, etc. So very, very important. And those, all those Google analytics, etc., are such a great key points for you to understand where you're going, where you're heading as a business. Very well put. Celia, I think you were about to jump in there as well. I was. I was going to say it's important to identify, to have your brand identity. So it has this really cohesive feeling like in your social media, in your, any images, any videos that you put out, it, that it feels like it's your brand. So it's important to identify what your brand is. And honestly, working with a marketing agency is a great way to do that. Um, if that's not in the budget, then it's, that's okay too, but just make it consistent and cohesive. So it, it, it already has a feeling so that you're transported before you even get to the venue. And then one day when you have an opportunity to visit the venue, you're like, okay, everything has come to life. Yeah. Storytelling all the way through. Uh, and, and Gerald, uh, we talked about, you know, the merge between rock and roll and, and sort of classical was, was street, uh, street fancy. <laughs> how, do, how do you bring that to life in, in your business online? Um, 
for that, I think brand identity comes into 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 mind where when you want to kind of send a certain message, you know, you want to you want a certain image or or color scheme to kind of resonate with certain certain kind of mood or emotions in 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 people and uh, your followers on social media. So that is a kind of like a key factor in deciding what kind of photos that we want to take, how we want to promote them, and what how. I think the key point also is to promote them or to plan them ahead of time, to plan what you're going to post and keeping them consistent, like what Celia said, to keep it consistent so that the messaging is quite clear cut. Uh, but of course, there are times where you want to stretch things up a little bit. And I think that's what, that's, that's the good thing about being a fan, sorry, being an independent brand. Uh, we have all these different ways around a certain promotion or campaign activation. Understood. And I think that's uh, a lot to think about for our guests right now who are joining us. And I, I'm pretty sure every topic that we're thinking about has been covered thus far. We do have many questions coming through, so I'm told. So we may pop across to them and see what they think. I think the channel's supposed to change now. Yay, there it is. Okay. So what do we find the most challenging about bringing your bar program to life? Uh, we are gonna have the studio send us through some questions from you all. I'm just waiting for the first one to come up. Whilst I'm waiting for this first question to come up. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay, got it, got it. Uh, what kind of thought processes go inside while concocting the bar program? Uh, so I guess this speaks to specifically the program of drinks. Um, we've identified that there's a lot to think about in terms of bringing the brand to life, but when you're considering a bar program, what's the, what's the first thing that comes to mind for you guys? Or the thought process, is it design, marketing, drinks? execution or I guess the stepping stones can I please I think for me I found a, a, a combination where music playlist has a very strong direction of what kind of bar program uh, is going to come to life so for example when when we first thought of uh, Stego Flamingo the playlist was a lot of rock and roll and hip-hop and that's where the idea of street posh came about and we wanted to kind of create, or we want to do a classic cocktail bar that is not, is a, is a bit more fun and casual, a bit more dive in the middle. So the whole idea of, uh, for me at least, when, when we think about uh, concepts or ideas, uh, creating a music playlist kind of helps to, to make the flow easier or ease up the, the it kind of, it's, it's, it oils the engine or the creative engine. Yeah, music plays a huge role. Um, any, any, any others? What's, what's, what's your first steps? Everyone pass on your first steps as soon as you're thinking about a concept you have in your mind. So it's a lot of spitballing, like bouncing ideas off other people to kind, to kind of create a, a well-formed and cemented concept. So for the new... So Deadfall has a new menu coming out, Ballroom has a new menu coming out, and Revival has a menu coming out. And so we wanted to make sure they were all completely different. But again, there was kind of an idea of what we wanted to do, but we just needed to discuss it and spitball. And as you kind of chat things, you'll figure out what will work and what won't. So for Revival, we have a menu that's completely based on art movements, looking at different art movements, looking at three paintings per art movement, one drink per painting. And so that's a very more like visceral way of how to hash out a concept. Whereas for ballroom, it's looking at one ingredient in two different ways over the course of 10 pages. Um, so it's again, like kind of trying to do something that will be fun and interesting and creative, right? Like there has to be a sense of creativity in it. So even with maybe Sammy that has like a slightly more classic focused menu, 
their creativity is like, it's still incredibly wonderful and fun and sexy and enjoyable. So it doesn't have to be crazy in terms of the concept and what you're trying to achieve. It just has to be fun, I think. Absolutely. Uh, and, and Ms. Martin there, uh, what are your thoughts on the first processes? I agree. I like silly how you mentioned it. Like maybe we do classic drinks, but maybe rest is more crazy in terms of the fun or reverse. Um, and it's very, very important, you know, to di diversify those two things. Um, and yeah, for us, of course, we have some staple drinks we want to serve forever in all other venues, like mini cocktails or coffee cocktails or martini trolley and stuff like that. Drink with the bubble. <laughs> uh, but what is important for the concept, you know, it's, it's you know, as, as, as Jarl said, the music, the light, the aircon, the furniture, all these little things are part of the concept. And, you know, that's why for the last three years, menu was heavily or signature cocktails heavily influenced by the Rat Pack, the, 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 the places they visited, their favorite casinos, their, their favorite songs, uh, because it's very easy, understandable for people and they can relate to it. So whatever we do as a concept, try to understand you are just regular guests and try to make it easier for them to understand. Yeah. Yeah, it's got to be translatable, right? Um, and it has to be fun, as, as Sylvia is saying, and it has to be relatable back to the concept, as, as Gerald was saying. I think it is a mixture of all those things. Um, and that kind of relates to the next question we have, uh, which is how do you know when the market is ready for a specific uh, USP or, um, for example, a, a technical gastronomy focused versus sustainably focused, etc.? Like how, what are the key identifiers that the market is right for something that might be a bit more off the wall or a bit more niche? How about we go to Celia, who's just about to open Revival? Um, I think a lot of it comes down to how educated the, the market is. So, I mean, we're very fortunate in Singapore and also Sydney, you generally have a very educated consumer. So we get away with doing a lot more in terms of pushing the boundaries. Um, and so we're very fortunate in that sense. And I think second to that, if you're in a market that is slightly less educated in terms of consumer knowledge, then it's important to have your messaging right. I think if your messaging is right and your messaging is strong, and this is one of Michael's kind of strongest points that he always talks about is messaging. If your messaging is good and your team can message your concept well, then I think you have a lot more leeway than you think. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, spot on. Um, so, so Gerald, this is your first concept that you've been opening uh, with the team. How did you sort of know that they'd be ready for, for a sort of mixed genre of, of uh, street caution? And how did you work that into your sort of concept? Did you have to change anything after you'd opened? I think this is a risk that we had to as well take uh, to kind of fuse two different genres together. Uh, our venue has a lot of dual identity. And I think we can see whether or not it, it is successful where based on the, 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 the customer's reactions, right? When Whether they're coming back, they're having fun, whether they are smiling, they're singing along, or they are kind of like leaving the place or not coming back. Uh, feedback, I think customer feedback is very important. In terms of tweaking stuff, yes, we had to tweak uh, some of the playlists in, to make it a bit more accessible and approachable, right? We had to cancel away some of the heavier songs and put a bit more lighthearted. Uh, I also created a new playlist for just for this this uh, 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. moment where it's so high energy that you just want that few hit songs. So the rest of the songs doesn't matter, right? And it makes it easy for the team uh, because they don't have to start putting in songs. They just click on the playlist and it goes uh, all your top hits and it kind of, it really brings up the energy and the, the, the energy of the place. Fantastic. And um, uh, Martin, you, I think you've, you've the three, three or four concepts now, all relating back to the, I guess, the master concept, correct? Yeah, correct. So what are your thoughts on this? Do you, uh, you've obviously learned from the first, maybe Sammy, and you've, you've sort of had that experience. What were your thoughts on assessing that market viability for the next three? Yeah, yeah correct. When we opened maybe Sammy in 2019, you know, we were the first of its kind here in Sydney, you know, wearing a jackets, you know, serving martinis and stuff like that. 
it might be risky back in then, but we tried it and it really worked. Our location is close to the port, so we used to have lots of international cruise ships here. We are just between Four Seasons and Shangri-La. So we always wanted to, you know, appear like a five-star hotel bar and we really did it well. And it's a winning formula. So why not to do it again in different location, slightly adapted, slightly changed. And it's really working. It's really, really working. And we want to we wanna be on that successful wave. And, um, and uh, yeah, we've been very lucky even with every single new concept because going straight back to this original maybe semi and even people going to Dina Nancy or semi junior or original maybe Frank, they're still like, ah, okay, these are the maybe semi guys. Of course, it's going to be great. All of them just having a pizza and Negroni, for example. I just, my only comment is more llamas next time would be my only, my only <laughs> comment. Um, I have time for just one more question. And I think I found the one. Um, how can you pitch your bar program internally when you're working for a larger company like a hotel or a casino? How would you go about pitching that to your bosses and bring it to life for them so they can invest in your idea. Uh, I think we've all been in similar positions at one point or another in, in our career. How would you put that forward to big bosses who have other factors playing in their mind like financials, et cetera? Oh, please, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Hudak. Yeah, yeah I, I, I started because I really had a hard or tough time back at the Savoy at the American Bar in London. Being there since 2014, 2018, we launched four successful menus. And of course, being surrounded by people like Eric Lawrence, for, instance, for example, it wasn't always easy to represent, present your ideas and kind of convince them this is the right idea. Uh, I really believe if you are a junior member of the team and you really want to convince someone that your voice is worthy enough to be you know, heard of and you know, being implemented in the program, you really have to prepare it from the beginning. I think it's very important to believe in your idea and not just, you know, telling them over the coffee, oh, I want to do this. Like have a proper presentation, structure, strong PowerPoint or PDF file, strong, you know, numbers behind, et cetera, et cetera, deep research. Uh, that's what I'm telling to my guys here as well. We run to launch a new menu in March and I give them complete freedom, but I'll tell them I'm not expecting just having a cocktail. I want to see everything. You know, I want to see the costings. I want to see you know, like consistency, uh, batching protocols, et cetera, et cetera, replicability, you know, if there's something else existing like that. So whenever you're pitching new idea to your, you know, managers or owners, like you have to really look at whole package, not just cocktail itself. And that's important. I completely agree with you there. Uh, what, is the what does the rest of our panel think? I was about to say something very similar to Martin, so I can wholeheartedly agree. I think it's important to show the the back process, you know, like make sure your numbers and your figures and everything else is up to scratch and then present it in a way that, you know, like shows your commitment and your passion and make it, I don't know, creative and fun. Fantastic. And Gerald, how about you, my man? What, what, what are you thinking there when, if you've been in a position uh, in a company in Singapore where you've needed to pitch, uh, pitch anything up the chain and how would you go yeah. about it? I think they will, they, will, they will come to the point where you will have to spend some money um, to get someone to kind of create uh, a set, your, your logo, your brand identity right from the start. So that when you create a deck or a pitch deck, it comes across more professional. I think professionalism is, is, is the key word here as well. It has to look proper and it has to look like it's been well thought of since day one. You want to put a bunch of PowerPoint slides that do not correspond to the brand or do not, do not look similar. So you want to spend some time, I think I spent about a couple of months just building up the pitch deck and learning how to build a pitch deck, um, putting on a different components and even tweaking the pitch deck to kind of suit what we want to do instead. I think it was a very different pitch deck from other usual uh, pitch deck. So yeah, I think you need to invest some time, uh, energy and money, you know, talk to other people, talk to, talk to your friends, talk to people who have open bars. Uh, yeah, I remember talking to uh, no Sleep Club, Hart Chen Yijun about what they feel about us going to the business and you know, get all this kind of advice. I think that's fantastic. I think that uh, really actually is a good point to close on. We are a huge community and we are an incredibly open one. Um, I think we've all at one point or another had to ask for a lot of advice to get to where we are today. And I don't think any of our guests should be uh, 
um, doing anything different. I think you should definitely go to the nearest bar owner that you trust and, and ask them how they went through that process. And of course, you can, I'm sure everyone on this panel today would be happy to field some questions uh, via their social media. Um, and I'm always here if anyone needs me too. Um, I think that's all we have time for today, trying to stay on track. Um, I want to thank you guys all so much for joining us and thank you so much for your time. Um, I really appreciate it. And say goodbye to our listeners. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.